All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of React Wednesdays. I am TJ Van Toll. I work as a developer advocate at Progress. And you know that because I've got the, the giant banner behind me today. And with me is always Dan Wilson. Dan, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm Dan Wilson, and I work for Blues Wireless. And you can tell that because my background is painted a fetching blue. <laughs> On brand. So if you are new here, React Wednesdays, this is a show we do. Actually, I can bump up the font size one notch here. We do it every Wednesday. Uh, we normally do this at 1 Eastern, which is an hour from now. We're at a slightly different time slot today. So thanks for those of you that joined us. If you want to keep track of that, there is a link here on our site, telework.com slash React Wednesdays, where you can add the site to your Google Calendar. You can get updates of upcoming shows and such. So we'll be taking a week off next week. But after that, we'll be talking about a pretty cool uh, story that Neto Fra, which hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, a pretty cool service. He wrote that rewriting a, I believe it's a service that was running on over a billion different devices. Like he talked about uh, testing JavaScript on a, an original Wii uh, machine. So I'm pretty interested to hear that. So you can add individual episodes to your site as well, uh, to your calendar as well to check yeah, it out. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, that's about analytics.js. And this week I found out we're using analytics.js. So I'm now 2% more interested in how all this works. <laughs> Very cool. So check that out. I'll toss the site in the chat as well if you want to check that out. You can also see that this week we are talking with the one and only Brandon Satrum. So Brandon, I'm going to welcome you to the stream. How's it going, man? Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm great. How are you all? Doing good, man. I see you've got the the blue microphone uh, cover too. Yes. So you're on, you're on brand also. I also have on brand. Yes, absolutely. It's required here. For the for the people that don't know you, you want to tell them who you are, what you do, all that good yeah. stuff? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Brandon Satram, I work for uh, a company called Blues Wireless as well, along with Dan. And uh, my role at the company is to lead our developer experience and marketing efforts. So I am focused on making sure that we not only have a product available to developers that is uh, that makes it IoT development easy and accessible for anybody, uh, and especially web developers, that's the background that I come from as well. Um, and we also try to make sure that we have docs, resources, developer portal, really everything that you need to get started with our products. Well, cool. And I know you've got quite the background in today's topic as well, so IoT type of stuff. So. Maybe you want to start by just introducing what do you want to talk about today? IoT, command centers, lots of fancy words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as I do that, let me provide a bit of context and background because I've had, I've, I've been in, a, you know, a technology professional for about 22 years now. And over that time, most of my career I've spent as a, in the web, focused on web technologies. Uh, I was a web developer for many years, product manager, primarily focused on developer tools with Telerik. Uh, and then progress. And about seven years ago, I started dabbling in the IoT space. I think many of us that are engineers, technologists in general, we get to this point where as much as we love pushing bits and bytes around, we also feel that pull of trying something physical, whether it's an Arduino device or Raspberry Pi or something along those lines. And so I started that about seven years ago and just got absolutely hooked. And Spent a lot of time just learning the ins and outs of the Arduino ecosystem, played with the Raspberry Pi, and really became interested not just in the hardware space, but this general idea of Internet of Things. Buzzword as though it may be, uh, the idea of taking something that is disconnected from the rest of the world and adding connectivity to it so that you can gain insight and the ability to control. And so I have spent the last seven years doing that on the side for a bit uh, about Four years ago, I joined uh, Particle to run their DevRel program. Particle is an IoT platform company, for those not familiar. And then just over a year ago, I made the jump over to Blues Wireless, and we launched our first product in December. And a lot of what we, a lot of what I think about and I focus on is the fact that there is a ton of opportunity in the IoT space when it comes to companies trying to add connectivity and automation to their devices or whether it's individuals trying to pursue a home automation project, there's more opportunity than there are developers that are actually 
IoT developers or even embedded or electrical engineers. And so I've always been a big believer in providing tools and experiences that allow the rest of us, those that don't have an electrical engineering background, to really not only understand the space, but start to work with it, to build apps and experiences. And so um, I did want to dive into, so all of that said to say, like the ultimate frame here is that with your audience in the React community, there is a there are millions of developers that I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for folks in the React space to actually start working with this space, not just in the hardware side, but on the web dashboard on the command center side as well. You know, I got into web development around the same time you did, Brandon, and I kind of see a similar approach. Back in the day, it was like left up to people who could program CGI to make websites. And then that got kind of distributed down to where you could know HTML and publish a website. So there became this sort of easy path and a lot of people jumped in on it. Are there parallels like that to the IoT industry? And if so, what are they? If not, what else would you say? Yeah, there absolutely are. I think this is probably a good a good chance. Let me actually switch over and share my screen because I have a couple of uh, of slides that I wanted to walk you all through, and then I can. Um, let's see. Ba, ba, ba. Cool, because I can go. promise if getting into web development in 1999 involved learning C and making binaries and deploying CGI, I'd probably be doing something else right now. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. It's the same thing. And that actually is very true over here as well. I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in just a second. And the reality is I think what happens is when a lot of people, myself included, take a look at the space, IoT, Internet of Things, connectivity, we tend to look at this end-to-end -end idea of, okay, we need to build something with sensors. We need to figure out some sort of microcontroller or, or single board computer. Oh, that sounds like C, C++, that's icky. <laughs> You know, then, you know, I need some sort of way of building a network interface. If I'm doing IoT, there has to be an internet piece of it. We got to securely get that to the cloud. We have to store it somewhere. And then we get to do the fun part, which is building some sort of web visualization on top of that. And when a lot of us come into this space early on, you know, we, we, can, we can look at the sensors and we can think like, okay, I know what I want to measure. And we can look at the command center piece and we got, kind of have a picture, right? And so... The demo I'm going to do today, what I'm effectively like my problem set is that I want to monitor my vital signs during the workday on a on a Bluetooth device and keep tabs on my stress levels. Ooh, I want right? to do that too. I'll send you one of these. I mean, yeah. I've been working from home for <laughs> over over. A, I've been working from home for over a decade, but we're all in this work from home life for over a year now, and on Slack all the time. And every time I Slack things, I feel like my heart rate goes up a little bit higher. So I want to just keep tabs on that and make sure I'm breathing deep, walking away, doing all that kind of stuff. So I know the sensors, I know what I want to measure, and I know what I want to see on the other side, which is a nice, pretty vitals dashboard. The problem I think that a lot of us get into is we look at this middle piece and we're like, I have no idea what I want to do there. I, yep. I don't really know that I get <laughs> how this all fits together. And this is really where the complexity lies. This is the here be dragons part of the IoT, right? We, we may know the sensors, but we also think, well, what kind of sensor options do we have? We ask, what microcontroller should I use? How do I connect to the cloud? Is that gonna be secure? How do I transfer data securely? Where do I store the data? And then finally, how do I build the dashboard? Now, hopefully the TLDR for you all here is the answer to that last question is we're gonna build it with a React, of course. Whoop, whoop. But for all of those other pieces, there's a lot of complexity there. And so when it comes to really unpacking that and adding simplicity, there's really two pieces that Dan's question brings to mind for me. The first is, there is so much opportunity in the IoT space to use a programming language and microcontroller that you are comfortable with, right? In fact, the example that I'm gonna to show today uses Python on a, it is an Arduino style device, but I'm not writing C, C++, I'm writing Python. You can do that on the Raspberry Pi. You can do that on individual devices. But then the middle piece there, the whole reason that Blues Wireless exists as a company is because we're trying to take out that complexity for connectivity. We don't dictate the sensors you need to buy. We don't dictate the microcontroller or the computer that you need to use to read from those sensors. We just want to provide a simple way to give you cellular access and a secure cloud service that is effectively just a data pump to get into your ultimate cloud application, whether it's AWS or Azure, so then you can build something out the other side. So it's kind of like React. Like if you didn't use React, you'd be doing a bunch of DOM pens and a bunch of low-level JavaScript. But with, because you're using React, your user interface, which is the joy part, is left up to you. 
Absolutely. but the react part sort of handles all that low level ceremony. That's frankly not interesting. And in the way of getting to the joy parts and in your hardware piece, the joy part is, can I hook up a sensor, read my vitals and get somewhere where I can read it. And all the things in the middle that are sort of must do's are kind of no joy jobs and maybe even complicated. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the complexity there is if you if you don't know C or C++, you can write Python, right? That's the I, I find Python, even though I've done C and C development for years, I find Python a lot more enjoyable. So that's what I want to write with these kinds of applications. And then on the connectivity side, I don't want to have to provision certificates or get a SIM card from a third party provider and worry about a monthly fee, three bucks a month just to have data access. I would rather just have a device. I know there's data there. I know where it sends its data and then I just get things out on the other side. And so just to give everybody in the audience a bit of context around this, the core of what Blue's Wireless produces is really two things. One is this product that we call the note card. And we love to nerd out about all of the, you know, the terminology on the slide. I'm not going to read everything, but the whole idea is that this is a cellular device that has connectivity baked in. So if you've ever played in this space before, you've looked at other providers, there are SIM cards you can buy with a monthly plan. There are devices that have embedded SIMs that have a monthly plan. There's no monthly plan here. This is the devices start at 49 US dollars and there's 500 megs and 10 years of connectivity baked in. One of the reasons why I love that as someone who's done IoT development for years is that I can do cellular projects at home without worrying about starting a clock on a plan, right? I also don't overload my, my Wi-Fi with yet another one of my IoT devices that I'm tinkering with. And that's yeah, I really- I want less stuff on my Wi-Fi. I mean, every, every day like a new crypto hack or some sort of something and like my Wi-Fi, I'm starting to think of it like a pristine environment and things need to be <laughs> exactly. outside of that. Exactly, do your crypto mining over cellular. In fact, one of the folks on our team did a project, <laughs> did a project on that. But the other piece is the, the cloud service. Explain it. <laughs> the other piece is the cloud service because this is, that's that's the other part of the story. It's not just about getting some cellular or Wi-Fi radio, it's also having a place for that to go before it goes to your application. And so. We also provide a service called NodeHub.io that's just designed to be the transport layer. It's not, it is not your business logic. It is not where your ultimate cloud application lives. We're not trying to be a platform. It's really just designed to give you an easy way to take data out of your devices, to, to basically read something from a sensor and put it in on the other end. And the approach that we use for that is 100% JSON. Uh, this is one of my favorite things. One of the things that drew me to Blues back when I was talking to them last year was this idea that I can send, the way that I communicate with the device is not using cryptic commands. I'm not having to write some write to some crazy C interface. I'm literally just sending JSON objects to the device or JSON requests, and that adds data, that sends data, that performs syncs. All of that stuff actually is right there, baked in. So the whole well, reason. Let me just ask a question here. Is yeah. it? Going back to your previous slide, it almost sounds like Blues is almost a data logistics company that gets data from my sensors out to where, wherever my cloud is. Is that is that an oversimplification? No, not at all. I think that's absolutely right, right? It's not designed to be a destination. It's designed to be just a secure conduit. That's it, right? You're just trying to connect point A to point B without having to worry about certificates, provisioning, VPN access, tunnels. All that kind of stuff is is handled for you. Just like you said a few minutes ago, Dan, it is the piece of it, it takes it allows you to focus on the joy of, of building these kinds of applications because you just trust that the transport stuff is there. It all works. The connections are made. Everything is there when you need it to be. So that means as a developer, my sort of work ends at handing this note card data and after everything I've configured, and then I, I would receive that data in the cloud and what happens in the middle could be thought of as magic and always works and I don't need to be bothered with it. Is that true? Right. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And the whole reason that I shared that, again, this is, you know, I wanna focus more on the React piece here ultimately, but I shared this just to say that that's a piece to your question earlier, Dan, where we're trying to introduce some simplicity into this complexity, right? Like you can choose whichever sensors you prefer, that's dealer's choice, right? Whatever sensors, whatever host, that's up to you. You have that freedom of choice. The note card and note hub take the complexity out of this middle piece. But the reality is that for most of us, the whole reason that IoT applications exist, and if, if those listening 
don't hear anything else from me today, hear this. The most important part of any IoT application and the reason why they exist is because is because of what you get out the other end, whether it's a visualization or whether it's remote control. Like these applications exist because of the person viewing the screen on the other side wants to know something or wants to understand something or needs the ability to control it. And so this is the piece that is still vastly, vastly underserved in our space. And so what I wanted to show everybody today was using Azure and React to build this kind of a command center uh, to actually show off how easy it is to build these kinds of applications. And I'll, I'll show the note card off, of course, while we go through that. Sounds good. So the project that I worked on is what I, I, I hinted at already. I'm calling it this work from home stress monitor. <laughs> so I have, I have on, my, on my arm this polar heart rate monitor uh, that's a Bluetooth heart rate monitor. And then I also have on my desk a device that has a, that can read from that over Bluetooth as well as a temperature sensor and a microphone. So that's a, a Bluetooth feather and I'm running a variant of Python called CircuitPython. That's my actual firmware application. On the network side, my interface is the note card and a, and a companion board that we call note carriers. I'll show you this in a second. I'm connecting to Note Hub. I am saving my data in Azure Function Apps and Azure Cosmos DB. And then my command center is in React. So there are a lot of moving pieces here, but the ultimate thing is that I want to emphasize that a lot of this middle stuff here is made very easy by the note card. And then because of that, we can spend more time on the fun pieces of actually building out visualization and remote control. So with that said, let me actually, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a second because I want to show you all my desk, my messy desktop really quickly and what's on it. There's a whole lot here, but the important piece is this. Uh, this product here in the middle, this is the note card. This is, a, this is our cellular module. It's sitting in this board called a note carrier that has a socket on it that will connect to any Adafruit feather style device. These feather style devices come in all shapes and sizes. There's tons of them. You can get them and they run C, C++, Arduino. This particular one, has Bluetooth and it runs Python, uh, which is the reason why I love it. You'll see, just quick plug, there are other variants of our boards that actually will sit on top of a Raspberry Pi as well. So if that is your, if your preference, if you prefer to use the Pi, you can uh, you can do that as well. It looks so, like those things just click together like Legos. It can't be that simple, can it? Why, Dane, it is that simple. <laughs> well, and hold on. I made before. Um, <laughs> So is the USB connection how you're actually getting the code to that device? That is a great question, TJ. It is, yeah. So you'll notice, I can go back to sharing my screen real quick just so we can camp on it for just a moment. I actually have two USB connections here. Uh, only one of these is required. This other one is just, is this the one here is connected directly to the note card, which actually allows me to send JSON commands in and out to the device. But this side is actually connected to this board and the board in here, this is the, this is the Adafruit feather device <clears throat> and that's connected over USB. And so I'm using a local development environment that, uh, that allows me to push code to it directly over USB. Yeah. And then you said, so you're, you, you've got devices that are giving off sensor data. So is, how is, how exactly are you picking up on that sensor data? Like the heart rate data, I get that you have a device on you that's sending it out, yeah. but what's, what's the receiving end of that? I'm glad you asked, let me show you. So <laughs> I have, I have a, this editor is a simple, a simple Python editor called Mu, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, it's actually really nice. It works with Python on the Pi. Uh, I've, I've used it with my kids before. It's actually a really nice lightweight editor. Um, I prefer to use VS Code for Python, but this actually has a nice built-in terminal, so it works fine. But I'm not going to dig into the specifics of Python for those not familiar, but the important thing to know here is that I have in this device uh, a series of libraries that I'm pulling in that give me not only access to the various sensors that are on this microcontroller. So this controller has a, a BMP temperature and humidity sensor. It also has a relative humidity sensor and it has a built-in microphone and so in, and Bluetooth. And so there's actually a lot packed in this little device. And on the Bluetooth side, 
I'm actually pulling in a bunch of different uh, Adafruit Bluetooth libraries or BLE libraries. And the key thing here, TJ, to answer your question is that most standard Bluetooth device, uh, devices, if they follow the BLE spec, they actually will advertise a consistent set of capabilities to any device that can read them. And so in the case of a polar heart rate sensor, the things that it, it, they all produce device info, so you can read metadata about the device, service about the battery charge, and then also if it's a device that has a heart rate sensor, a heart rate service. And the nice thing about the Bluetooth spec is that you can actually know, doesn't matter who made it, as long as they advertise that service, you can know exactly what the attributes are that that service will publish, how to connect to it, all that kind of stuff without having to do a lot of manual trial and error. So in addition to the Bluetooth sensors, I actually also have a connection to the note card. And this is our this is the this is the Blues Wireless device with a cellular radio. Um, I connect to a couple of my sensors here to get temperature and humidity. I connect to the microphone. You'll see why I use that in just a moment. And then on the Bluetooth side, when it comes to actually getting the heart rate data, this is basically just a simple process of scanning for available devices that are within range. Once I've connected to those devices, if the, if the device has, if it's connected, reading information from its device info service, which tells me the name of the manufacturer, the model number, reading info from the battery service that tells me the current charge of the device, and then finally getting my heart rate information from the device. And those are all returned back. So once I've done that, that is the sort of connection piece where I'm actually scanning for those devices. And you'll see this actually uh, here at the beginning, uh, blah, 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 right here. I'm getting the heart rate device here. Uh, and then I'm, I'm, I'm printing those readings out to the console. So you'll see those in just a moment. But the real sort of secret sauce here on the Blues Wireless side is once I get that information, then what I'm doing is I'm sending a JSON object to the note card that has that data that I want to publish. And that is a arbitrary, there are certain things that you have to have in certain JSON requests with the note card. That is our API, as it were. But when it comes to passing in your own data, all you need to do is specify some arbitrary JSON body that has the values that you want to send. And so I'm sending temperature, humidity, pressure, the sound level that I'm reading, and my heart rate. And then that's actually getting sent to the device. You know, looking over this Python code, it looks like you're doing a lot of assembling of data packets, but there's not any really hardcore crunching in here. None of this looks scary or weird. No, it's not, or I wouldn't be able to write it. I mean, <laughs> if it weren't <laughs> if it weren't for all this, I mean, that that's the reality. If it's so simple that I can do it, it's actually really quite accessible for anybody to get into this. And I'm not a Python expert. I love it. It actually don't don't tell anybody, but it is actually my favorite programming language. But uh, a lot of this with the kinds of APIs and libraries that are available today for anybody, this is easy. This is really easy to pick up. One other thing that's sort of interesting in this project that I sort of skipped over is that I'm also checking the heart rate, battery level, and sound level against a couple of uh, guards that I've set, notification levels. And if any of those are out of the range that I want, what I'm actually doing is I'm sending a notification. I'm actually sending a separate note to the note card that goes into a different bucket. These files that we call note files are basically just buckets for your data. Um, and though that ends up then syncing directly into a different location to fire an alert. And you'll see those uh, in action in just a moment. Okay, that's kind of important. So there's, there's data and then there's places to send the data and each place can have different things that it does somewhere else, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. That was vague, yeah. so hopefully you have a slide on that or we'll walk us through it a bit more later. Yeah, no, I will, absolutely. So I want to actually show what this looks like on the event side through NodeHub. So as I'm running this, I can actually show you, I'll, I'll show very quickly what, as I'm running this application, what's happening is I'm getting my regular readings, I'm getting the readings in C, converting those as I send them along. But you'll notice too that as I'm talking, my voice is carrying above the sound level, the sound max level that I've set. So that's actually firing alerts, but you'll see as I'm debugging, as I'm out here. If, if possible, can you bump up the font size on both, both sides? Yeah, I absolutely can. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> sure. 
So on this side, on the right hand side, what I'm what I'm debugging out or outputting is basically the actual note, the actual JSON object that is getting sent over to the note card. That is reading that, it's saving it its internal memory. And based on rules that I've set up to configure it, it's then syncing that data to a project that I have in the Note Hub. <clears throat> now, Note Hub projects are like any other sort of a cloud application projects that you might create. You have a project that is a collection of devices. Every one of those devices is configured to receive data uh, to this location. And then you can decide on the other end where you want to send that data so that you can build an application with it. So the project that I'm working with here is called my work from home stress detector. I have a single device that's in here. And then if I look at my events for the device, you can actually see that data as it comes in. So because this is a cellular device with GPS baked in, which is, I think is something I actually failed to mention just a few minutes ago, I can actually not only get the location of the tower, the cell tower the device is connected to, but also which GPS location, if I prefer to use that, that's opt-in. But then for every individual event that comes along, I can see the actual JSON body, what that looks like. Um, I can see the full JSON object that comes in from the note card, which also includes things like the location of the tower, log data for routing, things like that as well. All of that is actually baked in here. Uh, but like I mentioned before, and Dan underscored this point with a few of his questions, <clears throat> this is not the end all be all. The whole goal is not to actually get these this data into Note, into Note Hub, and then you just sort of look at these raw views of events and do nothing with it, right? Like the whole yeah, point yeah. is to actually do something else with it. But to Dan's other question about buckets and you know where things go, you'll notice that there's two actually, there's two different types of files here. I mentioned the general sensor readings, that's just heart rate, pressure, humidity, all that stuff. But then the alerts go into a different bucket. And the reason why they do that, I do that is because it allows me to then send that data into another location. And so the way that we do that in Note Hub is with what's called routing. Um, routes are designed to be, <coughs> excuse me, simple connections between Note Hub and your cloud application of choice. I'm gonna pause for a second and drink water. Yeah, it's funny, as he's going through this, one of the things I thought of is A, an HR department might want to know if people are freaking out at home, and then B, we might not want HR to know we're freaking out at home. Yeah. But then, you know, there's possibly a whole span of people who work in dangerous areas that have like high temperature or weird humidity or maybe some other conditions that need to be monitored. And if you're bouncing off a GPS signal, this might be a way to sort of track a, a group of people as they do something dangerous to make sure it doesn't get too dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there are some great examples of that out there. The note card actually with a, one of our carrier devices can be configured to run as a standalone asset tracker. So you could attach it to a tanker. You could put it on the back of a truck if you needed to and actually not only view where the device is in the world, but know sort of what its ambient temperature is, where it is, vibration on the device, all those kinds of things. Again, the whole reason why this industry exists is to capture this kind of information so that we can get insight and also opportunity to make change and improve the way that these devices function. But a lot of that really depends here on not just getting data in a place like this, but where we then send it on the other side. And so routing, <clears throat> the way that we describe it is that this is a way for you to actually take your data from our point A and put it anywhere you want. So when you create a new route, you have the ability to send a general HTTP, HTTPS request response. You can tie into Azure functions, MQTT, general webhooks, really anywhere you wanna go, you can send your data. What I have configured, <clears throat> I have a couple of, of routes that are actually configured here. Two that are actually going to uh, Azure, to actually to an Azure function app. And then one that's going to Twilio, interestingly enough. And, uh, interestingly enough. So every time that I fire one of those alerts, not only are you gonna see that on my dashboard here in a few moments, but I'm actually routing it directly to my Twilio application so that I get a text message that tells me I need to calm down, breathe easy, take a break, whatever it may be. So that those notifications for low battery, high heart rate, high noise go to that location as well. But on the Azure side, what I have configured for both of these and is, is, a, is effectively a couple of different things. And I'm going to be showing 
fine if you're watching live. I'm showing keys, but these projects are going to get shut down as soon as this live stream is over. <laughs> but the important thing now, people. That's right. Act now if you want to if you want to DDoS my uh, my Azure account. Uh, I can actually choose the individual buckets or note files that the data comes in from that that route is applicable to. There's, you can send a lot of data into a lot of different locations, but I can target and say I only care about data that comes into this bucket. And then you can actually transform it uh, using something called JSONada. Interestingly enough, even after being a web developer for many years, I hadn't, I hadn't played with JSONada much before joining Blues, and it's actually a really nice data transformation library that's 100% JSON based. And you can go all the way into defining functions that act on individual elements. But I'm, all that I'm doing here is basically taking that existing giant event body, right? Because when you, when you transform an individual item, I can take everything from this JSON object and I can send it to my cloud service, but I don't have to send it all. So what I'm choosing to do with JSONata is to say, okay, only my end application only cares about when the event was created, humidity, pressure, sound level. I'm gonna convert the temperature to Fahrenheit because America, and I'm gonna take the heart rate. I'm gonna send that out as well. And that's okay, gonna- So, so that just to clarify, you've got raw data that has lots of stuff. And then you have this note hub that allows you to do a transformational step and then push the transform JSON data somewhere else. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I'm so what you. happens when every time an event comes in at this route, Node Hub will take the, the raw payload, it'll run it through this transforma transformation, and then it sends it to this location that I've specified. So this location, just to show you very quickly, is a very, very simple, very, very simple JavaScript-based function that I'm running inside of a function app. Really, all I'm doing is taking the body, and I am, if it's an alert, I send it to a different storage location, right? And if it is a, and actually what's interesting is routing these two, I'm taking different data here. They're both going to the same save health data endpoint, but I've just transformed the data based on what's different about what comes in from this note file or from this bucket, right? And so alerts go into one Cosmos DB bucket, I don't know if that's the right name for Cosmos. And then health data goes into a different place. And then I just return the response. That's literally it. Because I've already done the transformation on this side. I don't have to spend any of my compute cycles on the Azure side transforming the data because it's done here for me inside of NodeHub. Yeah, and it also seems interesting because once you deploy the device, it can be difficult to change that source code. But changing things in this NodeHub looks like it'd be pretty straightforward and friction-free. Right. Yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely. And you can also, you can take individual routes, you can fork them and duplicate them if you're looking to experiment with things. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some new features coming in NodeHub that will actually also give you the ability to validate this, to validate JSONata as you write it to make sure that you don't do anything that fails. But, uh, and then as individual events come through, you can actually view the route log for these to make sure that, okay, yep, this is the right response that I want back. So I know that that data actually made it in. So one of the things that's interesting is you know, I'm not locked into your choice of cloud providers when I use this. I can sort of bring my own sensors and bring my own endpoints and just not worry about the messy middle. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have examples. One thing I guess that's probably probably worth worth mentioning to the audience listening is that we have examples of what all of this looks like in our developer portal, dev.blues.io. And here we actually have, there's a couple of different things that are interesting. We have a you know quick exploration of what the note card API actually looks like. If you have a device on hand, you can actually, this is through, through the, the magic and power of web USB, you can actually connect directly into a device and issue, uh, issue note card commands through directly. So you can do uh, hub that get give me information about my device so you can actually talk directly to a physical device from within inside the browser even before you go and build an application with python or arduino or something along those lines but when you are ready to build we have a quick start that walks through all of this sort of getting started with the product as well as a set of tutorials for working with different programming languages but then relevant to your question dan a set of tutorials for actually connecting to AWS, Azure, Datacake, Google Cloud, a bunch of different cloud providers. I mean, one of the really important things that we want to communicate to developers is that we can connect any device to any cloud. We are not opinionated about how you read from data or the programming language you prefer. 
we don't really care who your cloud provider is. We want to make as long as we can make it as easy as possible for you to actually get your data in that location. And so yeah. I, I find this interesting because honestly, like I, I like the way that you set all this up, because to be totally honest with you, this is all of this stuff is the stuff that I don't want to care about at all. Right. <laughs> like I, we're almost getting to the part where it's like a front end developer. It's like, oh, OK. Um, you solve the problem of getting the data from the place, whatever sensor or wherever it is, to where all of this is about connecting to where I actually want my data, whether that's right. Cosmos or AWS or you know, insert your service here sort of thing. Because then it's like, OK, now I'm in my world where I know I'm comfortable. I know what I, what I can do Absolutely. and go from there. Hey, speaking yeah. of comfortable, Quad Vinci Soy had an interesting question about Web USB and, and uh, also has a great username. Brandon, could you just like give like the quick TLDR of what Web USB is? That's really not something I think many people know. Yeah, this is one of my favorite features in in the Dev Portal. But we're relying on a we're relying on a, a, a capability that is in Google Chrome and Brave and Edge. So as long as it's one of those three Chromium-based browsers, uh, we provide the ability to actually use, to, to connect directly to a USB connected device and speak to it over serial. And so it's a, it's a combination of the web USB, USB spec and the web serial spec. Uh, if you're a big HTML standards person, uh, it is not supported in Firefox or Safari. So Firefox yet, Safari, who knows? God, maybe ever. Uh, but if you use a Chromium-based browser, you can actually talk directly to a device, and it's really nice. So we pipe all of your commands. Normally, using a product like ours, you'd have to install a CLI. And we have a CLI that gives you all of these capabilities as well. But we also, through the power and magic of Web USB and Web Serial, you can actually go through this entire quick start and send commands directly in. And what you're seeing back in this response in this terminal here is the exact response that I would see from that physical device, even if I were connected to it over the CLI. So that's pretty cool and very at home for web developers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I had to Google it. I just put a link to the the docs in the chat because as you were saying it too, I, I also had that moment of like, I did not know that was the thing. We what's funny is that we ran it. We we were actually running as a running it in preview mode for months, but they finally took it off of took the feature flag off of it. I think a month or two ago in Chrome. So Chrome ninety nine. They backported it, but yeah, I would love to for people to try this and, and check it out. There's more that we want to do here in the developer portal, but there is a full on note card playground as well. That's full screen. Go nuts. Who loves who doesn't love having a command line in the browser? So that's what we've got here. So I have data now that I have data here in, I have my health data and my alerts data that are actually showing up inside of Cosmos DB. Uh, again, you put, you put this wherever you want. You can access our API directly if you want to use it as your event store. But what I find is that most customers already have a place that they want to, they're, that they're sending data. So that's why I built this in this form. Uh, but once I've done that, I now I also have a couple of events or excuse me, a couple of serverless functions that will actually get my health data out. And again, this is very simple. Um, I'm pulling my data out of my health data storage, my Cosmos DB object. Um, I'm just I'm just doing a quick sort just to make sure that the event created is that the first of the latest event shows up at the top of the stack and then transforming it a tiny little bit when it comes back down. And this is another important piece, right? A lot of times when we're building front end applications for sensor data, we need to massage the data a bit to display it in the way that we need to, whether it's because of our charting library needs X and Y values in a certain way, or because we just find it easier to get things done for us on the cloud side before we do a bunch of transformations uh, on the client side. And so I'm doing a bit of that here and then sending an array of readings that has everything that I have, the last created, beats per minute, all of, all of the good stuff that I've got that's actually coming down. Then on the other end, I have, I have the thing that we have, the, the whole reason that we're here talking, a React application that actually, actually shows me this data in real time. And this is a pretty simple, uh, simple application just using shards on the UI side. Um, and then um, I can't remember what I'm using for the, I'm using for the chart, just Nivo uh, for the line chart. So I have a nice responsive line chart. But what I'm, what I'm trying to illustrate in the dashboard is just showing 
current heart rate, temp, current charge, the sound level, 93 decibels. It's not, not too terribly bad. And then a historical view of the last several readings just over, you know, over the last 30 minutes or so of what I'm seeing for my heart rate, just kind of oscillated a bit as we've been talking, which is <laughs> normal. Uh, temperature in here, obviously staying pretty consistent. This is the this is the dashboard piece, the remote sort of remote monitoring side. And on the React side, and I am no pro React developer, so please be gentle with me, everyone. But effectively, I just have a series of components here that are designed to just pull this data out. So I am actually background refreshing the data every 15 or 20 seconds or so, not only getting my alerts, but also getting uh, actually I'll talk about environment variables in a second because I've been saving that for saving that for last. Um, getting my health data, getting alerts, and then if alerts come in, actually displaying those on the screen. What's happening on the Python side is that I am publishing, I'm, I'm publishing notifications instantaneously, but only publishing sensor data, even though I'm reading it every 60 seconds or so, every 10 or 15 minutes. I mean, one of the things that you have to consider when building this kind of an application is that many IoT applications are not necessarily meant to be real time. There are certain things that you want as soon as possible, like alerts. And then there's other things like historical data over time that you may not need to have instantaneously. You just want to sort of queue up and then synchronize on a consistent schedule. And so this provides the ability uh, to do both of those things. Yeah, so, many React apps have similar concerns where, you know, the naive approach would be do everything in real time and load it all, but it would make for bad user experience. Can you just talk right. a little bit more about the difference between sensor data and maybe the normal data that developers are grabbing from APIs? Uh, I mean, there's not really a ton of difference. It's ultimately just another data point. I may not be understanding the question. Well, I think what he's getting at is with sensor data, there's potentially a crap ton of data, right? Like if you, because uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I can imagine like this example is pretty simple, but mm -hmm. imagine you're building a service where you distribute a bunch of these sensors and they're all picking up data. I mean, you could go nuts, right? Pick up data every second. Uh, it gets, <laughs> it doesn't take long to overwhelm much of anything, right? Because, it because you can, think about it, you hit something every second, that's 60 times a minute. You hit it every five seconds, you cut that load into a fifth. Yeah. And that's only, you're only four seconds out of date. And like someone might think, well, heart rate changes minute to minute or second to second. So let me push all this data out there. But not only is that not reasonable, it doesn't seem useful. Like, yeah, I think that's a great point. It's a good question. Thanks for, thanks for clarifying a bit, TJ. I, I think that the reality here is that there's a couple of different places where developers can control this. One piece that's really interesting and I think underserved is doing more work on the microcontroller side to average and summarize a bit of data. Because the reality is that, <clears throat> you know, I'm sending, I'm sending it, taking a, a sensor reading every 60 seconds, but the reality is that I don't necessarily need to stand there. One <laughs> so, did you, waiting, did you stress spike from the... Yes, from that question. <laughs> Take it down a notch, Mr. Sanders. No, it's just me being Apparently. too loud, right? <laughs> uh, so the, you know, there is more that you can actually do. When you think about the kind of data that you want to capture, I think the default we all go to in this space is to think, all right, I need to have a real-time view of my heart rate. So I'm going to capture it every second and I'm going to stream it along to the internet. But the reality is that even if you're capturing every second, what do you really want to know? You want to know at a point in time maybe what your heart rate average and high and low have been during that five minute period, right? So rather than sending a payload with 500 readings for a five minute window, you can send one reading that has high, low, median, you know, average, high, low, median, right? Yeah. And you can, from that information, really get what you want. So part of it for the developer comes to a question of what are you trying to get out the other end? And if you're trying to get a real time view, that, that changes how you design the application. If you if you really want to just make sure your inbounds and alerts go out real time, but over time your historical view just kind of shows how you're trending, like directionally how your heart is going or how the sensor readings are going, then you can sample frequently, but send less frequently. So that's gonna be part of the design dimension on the firmware side is how you actually send and sample. On the other side, however, for the developer, and this is a challenge, like one of the things that I'm doing to sort of trick, not trick, but this demo to make it a little bit more, you know, prettier on the sharing side is that I'm only actually slicing out the last 30 readings here and what I'm showing on the graph, because if I showed you everything, it would look, it would look nasty. 
And so what I need to do if I were building a production application is maybe build this as a streaming real-time chart that actually does go through data over time, or at least gives me the ability to select data ranges. But even before that, on the cloud application side, I could potentially be doing more to actually extract and transform data either before it goes in on the Azure Function side or before it comes back out on the Azure Function side to make sure that I'm only getting the data that's relevant to an individual request. So there is some transformation work that needs to happen because I think what tends to happen, and I've, I've, I've done this a bit with even demos that I've built, is with too much data, you can get into this place where you're doing a whole lot of slicing and dicing on the client side. And for a demo, it's nice. And I only build demos, so I don't have to worry about it too much, but for a production application, it can hurt you really, so just really. Just to sort of summarize here, the sensors are squawking all the time. The note hub, the note card, let's call it the note card, because that's its name, is a staging area to sort of hold on to data and maybe transform it or maybe do some <laughs> light processing and then you right. ship that over to the node hub that then routes it wherever you want it to go. And then it shows up in the data provider you expect for your web application. Absolutely. And so care needs to be taken at each one of those spots just to make sure what you're doing makes sense. And probably the naive send everything real time is probably not the best answer. No, no, probably not. Even on, even if you're using Wi-Fi as your, as your source for backhauling where you think all Wi-Fi is infinite, the reality is that you have to think about what you have to do with the data on the other side, how you want to present it, what you're actually, just like designing any kind of any kind of application with building a solution like this, you really have to think through all of the bits and pieces. There is certainly more to think about beyond just the website, but there is still there is, there's still consideration to be taken in how you're measuring, how you're presenting, what have you. And we've now, come full circle <laughs> to TJ's law, which is the answer to everything is, it depends. It depends, a absolutely, absolutely. Now, this is meant to be like I, we talked about this as an IoT command center application. All that I've shown so far is just the data visualization side. So in and of itself, it's not terribly useful if I need some capability to affect change down at the sensor level. And so there's another aspect of this demo that's really interesting that I wanted to highlight because any IoT application or most at least want to give you not just remote monitoring, but also remote control. And so I have this ability inside of the application that I built to affect the notifications, the notification levels that actually come down. You'll see, you may have seen these things stream across here, notify HR, BAT, and MAX, these values of when to send a notification based on your, my heart rate battery of the device or the, or the sound level. And these are stored in something that we call environment variables on the NodeHub side. Environment variables are ways for you to actually set project, fleet, and even individual device state that you can use and then change that remotely. And so I have UI here in the application that actually allows me to say, okay, you know what? I'm actually going to notify when my heart rate gets over 120. I'm going to drop the sound level down to 60. And I really, I don't care about low bat until I get down to 10, right? Now, when I save this, what happens on the, on the back end is that I'm actually saving into a set environment variables, I have a proxy to the Node Hub API. So we have a complete API. Uh, we actually just shipped the docs for this today. So we have a complete API for our cloud service that allows you to actually connect, get device, and device data, get out events, set environment variables, all those kinds of things. So what I have specified here is effectively just, I'm just putting updates with new environment variables into that API. What happens on the Note Hub side when I look at an individual device is that those values, if you, you can click on an individual device and then click on this environment tab here, and I can see that those values have been changed, that they're reflected, that's on the device. Now I mentioned these are, these are actually overridable. So you can set environment variables at the project level so that every new device that comes in automatically gets this without you having to hard code it or bake anything in. You can also set those on an individual device, which is what I've done here. The way that this then works, and I, I, I did this to emphasize that many IoT projects need to be bi-directional and the note card is bi-directional in nature also, is that the next time that that sync happens, you'll notice that these, these environment variables have now, have now been picked up. The next time it checks those, it's seeing, okay, now it's 120, now it's 10 for the battery and sound max is 60. So every time it runs back through, it sees 
And I just so happens the last sound level reading is 10. So I was right, you know, I'm in a decent range, but it picks those up automatically. So this is the remote control piece of this. So if I'm building an application and I'm sitting somewhere halfway across the world and I need a way to actually manage the behavior of my devices to change a threshold when a pump turns on or change how frequently I want to read from a certain sensor, I can do that. Environment variables is the way that we do it, but there are many other platforms that, that provide that same capability. And again, React application is the perfect place to provide this style of an interaction uh, in, in an application. Yeah, it seems like you're not too far off from maybe in the React app, assigning some point values for big heart rates or like big sound levels, and then integrating with the Amazon API to buy the first thing off your wish list if you get too many points accumulated. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. This message sponsored it's, by Amazon. Sky's the limit. Yeah. I do have a, so I have a question about the device itself. You, you mentioned like you could do some of the data massaging or some of the logic on the actual note card. Do you have to be careful at all of the, the amount of processing you do on that thing? Cause I, I have to imagine like it can run Python, but it's also not like a supercomputer either. Right. Like, what like what sort of hardware are we talking about? What can I throw at that? And like, how will I know if I'm like overloading it? That is a that's a great question, TJ. I would say that I have yet to see, I, I've I've yet to see an application that can overload a microcontroller with these kinds of activities. I mean, it's certainly possible. Um, and most microcontrollers these days, unless you're using an old like an eight bit Arduino, like the first one that I used seven years ago. You don't have to do much to overwhelm them. But the reality is that that you know Moore's law has been very good to the microcontroller industry, just like it has gotcha. for the rest of computing. And so a lot of the stock microcontrollers that you get nowadays, even if it's a $20 MCU, is running an ARM Cortex M4 processor. It can actually run several thousand operations every millisecond. You know, you need to do a bit of work with the pro the programming language actually influences that a little bit too. I keep, I mean, I'm not being that loud. I don't know why it's being so mean. <laughs> so uh, but you, Python is not as fast as C. So if you really, really care about performance in production, you're probably down in the C world, but Python's plenty fast enough and it keeps getting faster all the time. And as these microcontrollers get better, they get faster. And then if you're building something that really like, it's really, really timing intensive, you can go to a higher class processor like an ST Microelectronics or even use a single board computer like a Raspberry Pi or a Google Coral or Jetson Nano, something along those lines. When we start talking about things like edge machine learning, like it, it gets really, really interesting with some of those devices and they're very powerful. Yeah, no, I think I'm showing my lack of experience or the, the amount of time I've spent in the IoT world because I do remember a day where like you did have to be kind of careful about what you did there because there's only so much those little things could do, but uh, I suppose they can, they're quite powerful nowadays. They are. They've idiot proofed them to where I can't mess them up no matter how hard <laughs> I try. So wait till I get my soldering iron thing. out. <laughs> no, it is pretty cool because I like, I think what's interesting about this setup is you have multiple different layers you can do things, which is kind of nice, right? Like, uh, and actually, like, my thought, like if I were building something production scale with this would be just to think about where I'm putting things so that other people could understand like know where this logic could be. Cause you could, <laughs> I think my concern of having it on the device itself is like people could totally not realize it's happening there, especially if I'm working on a team uh, sort of thing. Yeah. I, I think it's important to know what work should take place on the MCU and what work should take place on your cloud itself. I mean, I, there's probably a segmentation there where once you know that you, you kind of stay in the lines. Yeah. Yeah, there absolutely is. And some of it is dealer's choice to a certain extent. There are some people that love to do like, like prefer to send raw data and then do transformations more on the cloud side, for instance, right? Like you'll notice I, I made a choice, a judgment call. I could have transformed like temperature from Celsius to Fahrenheit on the microcontroller rather yeah. than doing it later on the cloud side. But it is a choice of where, and I could also you know, hard code these notification levels and only, you know, and then change them through firmware. But the reality is that you have to think about 
how frequently you need to change and how accessible the device is when you need to change it. And we provide the capability to remotely update firmware over the air, but at the same time, if you have 500 devices that are physically deployed somewhere else, you wanna get your, your core firmware application running as efficiently and as small as possible and defer a lot of the moving pieces either into Node Hub or into your own cloud applications a, as much as possible, right? So you uh, line for more changes. Right. Yeah, you actually anticipated my question because it's actually pretty cool that you can do remote firmware updates. Like that process just kind of blows my mind a little bit. It It, it is really, really cool. Now, part of what, and we have this documented pretty extensively on our dev portal as well. We provide, there is a microcontroller on the note card itself that, that is running its own firmware. And we provide the capability to update that remotely as we release new features and fixes and things like that. But yeah, if you're working with, in ASP32 or working with you know, C-based environment and, we'll, and some even in Python, you have the ability to upload a firmware binary and actually pull that down onto the device and then just update it, update the device on the fly, restart and go on about your business, which is, which is uh, really cool. There's also another question in chat that I do not understand at all, Brandon, so I'm hoping you might get this. So Quad Venti Soy, do you anticipate a, um, Two different types of acronyms there in the note card. I don't know if you recognize either of those. Laura Wayne and Hollow. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We we are we exist to be a, a cloud connectivity company. We want to provide hardware that helps developers get from point A to point B. And right now, cellular is the model that we have started with. It's the model that we think deserves the most attention. And there's a lot of opportunity there, but I don't expect that we will stop there. So I'll just leave it at that. Cool. Well, your stress level went down this yeah, last few minutes. So you've, awesome. you've gotten into the, the, gotten demo, into the group. The demo I, is done and nothing failed. So yeah. I, feel, I feel pretty good about that. <laughs> no, I could see like, it, it's exciting stuff. Cause I could see like, honestly, like we could build something into Twitch to show like our live stress levels, right. Or our live heart rate using some of these things. And what's cool is that I mean, I've always known people have done that. These sort of things are possible. But now, like in my head, it's like, okay, well, I could see how like I as a React person could actually realistically go about doing it. Like I'd have to look up a little bit of Python coding. I haven't wrote Python in many, many years, but at least it's approachable. Like I know it's okay. not yeah. awful. And it yeah. solves the tabs versus spaces thing. That's exactly right. That's why I write Python now, because I don't have to have that argument with that or semicolons, right? It's all just, it, it's all there. Cool. And you're yeah. going to, you're anticipating my next question too. Like uh, uh, if people want to learn more, like all that sort of stuff. This right here. I, the whole reason I think that I wanted to do this was to really say that there is a lot of opportunity in the IoT space for more web-based dashboards and remote control applications. We need people building frameworks for this kind of stuff. We need people working with their companies, building applications for this. Uh, we, I would love to support anybody that's interested in going and doing this. So you can feel free to email me. Uh, if you want to try our stuff, um, definitely go to dev.blues.io. And even if you don't, grab an Arduino or Raspberry Pi and start building something uh, and build some remote control on the other side for sure. The final thing I want to say, if anybody is interested, uh, you can use the code react-wednesday at our store at shop.blues.io for 15% off one of our dev kits. If you lose the code, feel free to uh, send me an email, besaturateblues.com. Happy to, uh, to send that back. But if you have any questions, shoot me a line. But there's a lot of opportunity here, and I really, really would love to see uh, what, uh, what you folks can build with it. Yeah, no, I like it a lot. Anything that, like, lowers the barrier to me. I, I Again, I really like the context you frame this at is like taking care of the hard stuff so can focus on the sensor bit and the uh, uh, actually building the app that shows this. So very cool stuff, man. Thank you. Excited to chat with you guys. This is fun. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, so we usually like to wrap up with any plugs. I think I put up the blue stuff. So if you're curious about that, I just dropped the links into the chat. So make sure to check that out. Uh, Dan, do you have any plugs you want to end with today? Yeah, I mean, certainly we're looking to have conversations with web developers. So reach out like our Twitters are right here on the screen. I'll also mention the Enterprise React newsletter, which is a by developers for developers newsletter with excellent React content, especially for those who care about enterprise 
type developments. Yep. And I will drop that in the chat as well. And all I'll plug at the end is, again, we do this every week on React Wednesdays, taking a week off next week. But after that, we'll be back to talk about some cool analytics stuff. So if you like it, hang out, head to our website. You can subscribe to our calendar so you get notifications. We also put up, we're on YouTube. So if you miss recordings of these, you can check those out there as well. So but until then, man, thanks a lot. one last time, Brandon. This has been fun. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Appreciate it. it. Thanks, cool. everybody. Until next week. Have a good one.